Very beautiful. You may, you may be seated. If you are seeing too much of me, I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> I start thinking about how much I miss all of you. I think of the sound guys, the song leaders, the opening and closing prayer individuals. There's so much that goes into a holy convocation that sometimes we forget. And I don't like doing all of them. So uh, but this is what we have at this point. Again, as we come before God. There is so much to God's days of unleavened bread, <clears throat> and even all that has led up to these days. Tuesday night after sunset was the Passover, the first step in God's perfect plan. Passover commemorates the beginning step of salvation, redemption, the deliverance from sin. Again, that death penalty. It is only through Christ's sacrifice and repentance that sin can be forgiven. Sometimes we can forget about the repentance. Sins are not forgiven until they are repented of, but it begins with Christ's sacrifice where they can be repented of. All sin, again, can be forgiven when it is repented of. The New Testament Passover, as we looked at in previous sermons, the foot washing ordinance, the symbols of the bread and wine. Think of even yesterday when Jesus Christ would have been crucified around 3 p.m. back in the tomb or in the tomb at the heart of the earth around 5 p.m. And as if you can count, three days and three nights does not equal two and a half days, two days, one and a half days, however you want to count. Three days and three nights as Christ gave us the instruction. He was resurrected on the Sabbath afternoon, likely around 5 p.m., that exact three days and three nights from when he was put in the tomb. Also, the weeks leading up to last night, <clears throat> there have been the deleavening of our homes and properties, exhausting with the work done. Removal of leaven, which symbolizes sin during these days of unleavened bread. Leaven was to be removed by sunset last night. Last night, as we hopefully thought about as we kept the night to be much observed in our homes, the night that Israel came out of Egypt after 430 years. Think of the excitement. Turn over to Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> Some of these verses, and you, you think about how many years, 430 years. America wasn't even a nation that many years ago. You think... From 2020, if they came out this year, it would have been the year 1590 when they went into captivity. You think about the excitement, 430 years later, Exodus chapter 12 and verse 41, <clears throat> Exodus 12, 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night of solemn observance to the Lord for bringing them out of the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord, a solemn observance for all the children of Israel throughout their generations. So we realized last night, during the night, they came out of Egypt and that excitement that was there. Dropping down to chapter 13, <clears throat> verse 3 again covers this time and bringing us into the days of unleavened bread as we did last night at sunset. Exodus 13 and verse 3, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. This reminder is they went out of Egypt. And whose strength was it by? strength of the hand of the Lord who brought them out of Egypt. We think of this symbolism as hopefully we thought about last night and you think of how God called you out of this world, out of spiritual Egypt. That wonderful symbolism that reminds us of whose strength brought us out. It wasn't our strength, it was God's strength. We see as it goes through this whole section into verse 4, on this day you are going out in the month of Abib, 
And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. And we see other places talk of all your property, everything you own. It's not enough just to have the leaven out and then you get to the days and then you can put it back in. We see through this whole seven days that leaven is to be kept out. Verse 9, it shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this ordinance in its season from year to year. Think of that symbolism, again, of coming out of spiritual Egypt. We think of coming out of physical for the Israelites. The night to be much observed, the Israelites came out by night. We'll turn to that here in a bit, but you can put in your notes Deuteronomy 16 and verse 1. It also reminds us of our journey out of spiritual Egypt, God's calling in our life. There is so much behind this Feast of Unleavened Bread, so much in its meaning, so rich in how what we are to be reflecting on and thinking on in our lives. The leaven that represents sin, these seven days, has been put out by sundown last night. It's only possible to have sin put out by Christ's sacrifice and through repentance. Passover was not a holy day. It was a festival of God. There was still work finishing up the deleavening, if you still had that to work on, and to prepare for these days of unleavened bread, to be ready. Turn over to Leviticus chapter 23. You can hold the bookmark here. If you haven't already left it, we'll be back here at least one more time. That helps you. Leviticus 23, the only place where all of God's festivals are listed in one chapter. So it's always a good memory chapter. Leviticus chapter 23. We begin in verse 1. Leviticus 23, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, The feasts of the Lord. I will always emphasize this because I still remember deceptions of these are just Jewish days. No, they aren't. They are the feasts of the Lord. The feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, these are my feasts. As I mentioned before, how many times it talks about God's feasts, my feasts, who these belong to. We see the Sabbath mentioned. It doesn't tell us, well, during unleavened bread, you can skip the Sabbath. It doesn't, you don't need to keep it that week. No. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. Verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. We see in Exodus 12 and other places through the Bible, they have very specific times. We don't, well, coronavirus came, so we need to push these off and do them in the late summer. No, we don't cancel God's holy days. We see we have to keep them a little differently this year, but we're still keeping them. We then get into Passover and unleavened bread, verse 5. On the 14th day of the first month at twilight... And after that sunset, before it gets dark, when we kept it Tuesday evening, is the Lord's Passover. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. But you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So we see this reminder of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The first day and the last day are holy convocations. And again, this reminder, we eat unleavened bread throughout the whole festival. It's not, well, we eat some leavened bread on one day, all seven days, unleavened bread. Again, 
that removal of the leaven and keeping it out. The leaven should have been, already been removed last night by sunset. And that reminder is we are now to be keeping it out, not by our strength, but with God's help every step of the way. Turn back to Numbers chapter 33. <clears throat> Numbers chapter 33. Numbers chapter 33 and verse 1. Numbers 33 verse 1. These are the journeys of the children of Israel who went out of the land of Egypt. It's an interesting study to, to look up everywhere it says going out of Egypt. And again, this reference that's used a lot. Uh, who went out of the land of Egypt by their armies under the hand of Moses and Aaron. Under the hand, under the leadership. And we see it's by the power of God that brought them out, his strength. Verse 2, now Moses wrote down the starting points of their journeys at the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their starting points. They departed from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the month, on the day after the Passover. The children of Israel went out with boldness in the sight of all the Egyptians. This in the sight, they were not hidden. Think of this boldness with a high hand, other locations talk of, this excitement. They weren't trying to sneak out. Well, we need to get out before anyone notices we're gone. They went out with a high hand and boldness, that excitement that was there in God leading them out. We see as this was a sobering time as well for those that weren't following God. Verse 4, for the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had killed among them. Also on their gods, the Lord had executed judgment. That pagan worship we still see in us world today, Easter, going after pagan gods, we think of these things that are not in Scripture. We look at what God's command was to keep His days, not to change them to fit what we would like. We think God's people, again, coming out with boldness in the sight of the Egyptians. They could see it. Put in your notes again, Deuteronomy 16, verse 1. <clears throat> I think I referenced it earlier. Where again it says, the Lord your God brought you out of Egypt by night. That's night as they went out. Again, you think of this many people uh, leaving Egypt. It was not hidden. God being with them every step of the way. <clears throat> so this afternoon I'd like to look at the meaning of this Feast of Unleavened Bread. Of these days. And what it means to us. The title for this sermon, The Days of Unleavened Bread, Meaning for Us. Meaning for Us. Turn back to Deuteronomy 28. <clears throat> Chapter 28 and 29 of, Deut uh, of Numbers. I'm sorry if I said Deuteronomy. Numbers 28. <clears throat> uh, but both these chapters talk of the offerings, talk of the daily offerings, each of the offerings for the Sabbath, for all the festivals of God. Uh, and in this section, we see unleavened bread mentioned, uh, Numbers chapter 28. <clears throat> in verse 16, on the 14th day of the first month is the Passover of the Lord. We see very little mention here. Well, Exodus 12 goes through that in very good detail. Uh, verse 17, And on the fifteenth day of this month is the feast. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. Starts to go through the offerings in the temple and the sanctuary that were offered. Dropping down to verse 25. <clears throat> and on the seventh day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work. It's a reminder of having unleavened bread. Not eating leaven through any of the festivals. And it's a good principle to go through and be reminded. Uh, but doesn't mean that you can't fast during unleavened bread and not have a, 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 a leavening or unleavened bread one day if you want to fast. But this emphasis of not having leavened bread 
and to be thinking through these days of unleavened bread. Taking that reminder that God gives us during these days. We think of how different this seems. Uh, we do it every year, but you know, you get to where you're used to eating sandwiches, you're used to eating certain things for lunch, for dinner. You think of, you know, is it really that bad? Think of Egypt. Is Egypt really that bad? Is spiritual Egypt, sin, really that bad? I mean, everyone else seems to be doing it, and it seems to be all right. Turn over to 1 John chapter 2. <clears throat> First John chapter two First John chapter two and we'll begin in verse fifteen. <clears throat> First John two verse fifteen Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love, this word love here is agape, godly love, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever will of God that we are to be doing. This reminder here, putting it into practice, God's ways, living by every word of God. You think Egypt is really that bad. The Israelites had times of, oh, well, it used to be so much better back there. And they would think of things that maybe weren't even accurate, but they would look back instead of looking to what God's called me to. We think of how important coming out of Egypt, coming out of that spiritual Egypt, putting those sins out of our life with God's help. This world is not God's. It doesn't reflect His ways. We see a little bit more of that at this time, where a lot of the things that have been going around come back to eating unclean animals. Some of the assumptions that where this virus began Eating unclean animals, uncooked animals, which were unclean. Think of the curses that come from not following God. This world doesn't have the answers. We are not to become like this world. We are to be coming out of it, out of spiritual Egypt. We still live in it, but we're not to become like the world. We see as it says here in verse 17, <clears throat> He who does the will of God abides forever. But that promise is, are we doing the will of God? So we think of putting that leaven out of our homes, putting that sin, as it symbolizes, out of our lives with God's help. It does take work to keep that leaven out of our lives. Those seven days of unleavened bread, we don't eat leaven. We don't bring it into the home. And how quick and easy it takes place. And you think of that, <clears throat> even this year we had a, getting some ice cream, uh, I think it was Tuesday or, or Monday or Tuesday, and Emma was coming home from work and said, oh, get some ice cream. I said, just get one of everything, and obviously check the ingredients, and one of the things that was bought, thankfully we found out Tuesday, I think it was, so we just had to eat it quick and uh, get the rest of it out, um, but how quickly and easy it's in so many things. That sin, how quickly it pervades, how quickly it creeps in. We're reminded that we don't eat leaven, we don't bring it into our home. How quick it happens. Will we make it all seven days? It's a good lesson for us. Maybe this year will be a little easier. We're not getting out as much, uh, not eating in restaurants. You think of how quickly it jumps back in our life. Will it come in other ways? The neighbors bring over a loaf of bread, and you have to, oh, well, thank you very much, but these are the days of unleavened bread. Uh, think of what God will teach us through this year. Uh, still, I think I've shared this story before. I think it was 16 to 18 years 
ago, <clears throat> coming home from the first day of Unleavened Bread, you have the excitement, ah, the days, you just heard sermons, you're remembering what these days are, I remember we stopping, I think it was just, Emma was a baby, and Megan was probably five or six years old, and uh, Beth and I, we stopped at Sirloin Stockade, great buffet, so we can go through it, and easy, all right, no croutons, no croutons, okay, we've got no croutons, going through very carefully the buffet, you can pick out the things that you know are, have no leavening in them. And so being very careful, our plates were full and they had everything. And all right, no croutons. I kept remembering that phrase every time. Okay, no, crout no croutons. Don't forget, it's the days of unleavened bread. The waitress brings up to the table a big basket of fresh rolls. No croutons, no croutons. And I took the roll and I ate it and I gave it to Megan, my five, six-year-old at that time. Oh, I know she loved to have the bread and I'm, I'm in the, chewing it and I'm like, no, I couldn't even get through one day. And I still remember that sick feeling of, I gave it to my daughter. You're going to God repenting. I didn't mean to do this. I'm so sorry. But how quickly, it, it's not pork. I'm not, it's just bread. We eat it all year long. It's that staple. When we think of this reminder, how quickly it enters back in. Will we make it these seven days? It's a lesson in our life. Are we keeping sin out of our life? It goes beyond these seven days. But again, what are we to be learning? Here we are at God's Days of Unleavened Bread. <clears throat> I want to look specifically at three lessons to learn. Three lessons to learn. In God's days of unleavened bread. Uh, specifically, we're going to look at three knots. N O T S. Three knots. We look at these three lessons. Again, many to learn. Hopefully, you think about them through the week of what you learn through each of these and more lessons that you'll go through. But these three specific ones I want to look at. First one of these lessons. The first of these knots, verse, uh, first point here, not by your might. Not by your might. Turn back to Exodus chapter 12. <clears throat> these reminders that they can quickly enter in. Oh, I know it's not my might, but how quickly we, oh, but I can do this. And I've got to, instead of, all right, it's God's might. Exodus chapter 12, <clears throat> verse 15. Exodus chapter 12, <clears throat> and verse 15. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. In that beginning of that first day, was we looked at last night at sunset, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day unto the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. That's why when at that restaurant those years ago, where I just felt sick. And it wasn't on purpose. It wasn't, well, you know what? They put the, the, the bowl on my table, so God, I'm taking an exception. It wasn't something on purpose. It was something accidental. I repented and asked for God's forgiveness. This reminder here is someone just, you know, I don't care. I, I'm, I'll eat leaven whenever I want. I find it quite ironic, the pagan festival that falls through this week, they have the hot cross buns, exact opposite of what the Bible shows, almost in God's face. You think of this attitude, for whoever eats leavened bread from the first day until the seventh, that person shall be cut off from Israel. This phrase means put to death, willful. Verse 16, on the first day there shall be a holy convocation, and on the seventh day there shall be a holy convocation for you. No manner of work shall be done on them, but that which everyone must eat, that only may be prepared by you. So it was the preparing of meals was allowed on the first day of unleavened bread and last day of unleavened bread that are reminded here. Verse 17, <clears throat> So you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this same day I will have brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as an everlasting ordinance. In the first month and the fourteenth day, 
This is where at sunset last night, night to be much observed, beginning of the, the end of that 14th day, the month of evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of that month at evening. For seven days no leaven shall be found in your houses, since whoever eats that what is leavened, that same person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a stranger or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened in all your habitations. You shall eat unleavened bread. It's a reminder of these seven days of unleavened bread. Let's turn to chapter 13, verse 3. We read this earlier. But again, something Israel was to remember. It wasn't by their might. They didn't outsmart Pharaoh. They didn't figure out how to sneak out of the place and get out on their own. Again, whose might was it? Exodus chapter 13, verse 3, And Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. For by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Think of this reminder, strength of God's hand in their life brought them out of Egypt. Those plagues that went through Egypt, those things that took place, were by God's strength, God's might, that brought them out. Turn over to John chapter 6. <clears throat> Good to reflect on Israel coming out, because that same symbolism that we see to us here in John chapter 6. <clears throat> We're reading much of this during... Passover service. And read some of it last Sabbath, going through the bread and what it symbolizes in that New Testament Passover. John chapter 6. <clears throat> Think of these reminders as the bread from heaven, the manna that was there for the Israelites, Christ showing its. Uh, again, what we see here in John 6, verse 33, For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He gives life by giving his life. You think of this bread of God that's mentioned uh, through it and his sacrifice that's mentioned throughout this section. We see dropping down to verse 48, <clears throat> I am the bread of life. It's reminding of this living bread that came down from heaven, Jesus Christ. But it's interesting, these verses that are talked about, not everyone got it. The religious leaders of the day, the Jews, did not get it. In Christ, how does he respond? It's interesting how he responds. We see in verse 41, <clears throat> as he's explaining it on both ends, in the middle section here, in John chapter 6, verse 41, the Jews then murmured against him, they murmur against the Son of God, because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, Do not murmur among yourselves. Don't grumble or stop grumbling. Other translations. Verse 44, often a memory verse. Sometimes we can forget where this falls in this discussion. Verse 44, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No one. We think of Christ saying, No one can come to Christ except the Father calls him. Not, well, you know, unless I do uh, my job and I make sure I go out there and bring people in, you cannot grow the church. God the Father has it under control. God the Father is the one who calls. Here Christ could be the perfect example. Well, you know, I, I'm pretty good at bringing people in too. No, the Father is the one who calls. Verse 45 <clears throat> It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. 
this translation and the majority is is uh, actually a different translation it says ever for everyone who hears and has learned from the father comes to me who hears the father and has learned from the father think of that calling that god the father has given to each one of us how precious that is <clears throat> this word here for hears strong's number 191 here in verse 45, 191, who hears the Father to understand, to comprehend, not for you to brag about. You understand because God teaches us, has opened up our minds to understand. It's often, usually, well, let's go into the second word. The second word here, learned, <clears throat> Strong's number 3129. And it means to learn with a moral bearing and responsibility, to put it into practice. It's not just enough, oh yeah, I should be keeping the Sabbath, oh I should be keeping the days of unleavened bread, but I'm just too busy this week. Who hears and has learned, puts it into practice. Uh, as often we think about, we talked to some last night over the phone and hearing about how they came into the church and it, it seems like it's so often, you know, it's so clear when God starts to open up your mind. And as so many of us often have done, you, oh, well, I just explained it to all my relatives because it's clear as day. And they didn't like it. It didn't click with them. They didn't understand. Is that understanding? Well, you should have gone out and explained it better. You should have brought them into the church. No, the Father has to open the mind. The Father's the one who calls. So this reminder here, again, of what Christ is telling them. He starts to begin this whole section from verse 22 to verse 43 of explaining he's the bread that came down, came from heaven. Them not understanding. And Christ, well, let me explain it a better way for you so it'll finally start to click. He doesn't do that. He reiterates some of the same things. I'm the bread of life. He goes through this. But in the middle, he says, the Father has to open your mind. That's the only way this will click. And I love how Christ approaches it through this section. Uh, we see here as it <clears throat> continues into verse 53, <clears throat> some of the words we read in Passover, then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That seventh trump. Verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. These things he said to the, in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Goes through and explains it exactly the way God gives him to tell. We see then as I go into verse 60. <clears throat> Therefore many of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. The translation, this is a difficult saying. Who can understand it? I love the way Christ, again, Christ's example is always perfect. There's never a time you read anywhere in the scripture where, well, boy, Christ said this, but he shouldn't have said that. He said exactly what should have been said. He's not concerned. He's, oh, boy, how am I going to, I'm going to lose members. How can I lose disciples? How can I grow the church? He wasn't concerned. And I love his reply here, as they're saying this is a difficult thing to say. He brings it right back to what we read in verse 44. The Father has to call and open up the mind. Verse 61, when Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured, same word again we saw earlier, grumbled. When he heard this, about this, he said to them, does this offend you? Does this make you stumble? Oh, I don't want to make you stumble. Let me explain it better. Let me, I'm talking about the New Testament Passover. It's going to be coming and here. He doesn't go through and try to let me clarify. He just says, does this offend you? 
Verse 62, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit which gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. These disciples that were having difficulty understanding, they were looking at it from the physical. They weren't looking at it from the spiritual principle that he was trying to explain or went through. And Christ wasn't worried. He simply says, does this offend you? We see as he continues to explain why he's not concerned, verse 664, but there are some of you who do not believe. Again, faith is required. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were who did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted him by my Father. Again, goes right back to verse 44, what he already said. He bookmarks it on both ends. I've already told you, it's got to be granted from my Father. He knows the perfect time to let you know, the perfect time to call and to work, open up your mind. They weren't getting it. Christ wasn't worried. He wasn't a failure. He told them perfectly exactly what God the Father had given them, him. Verse 66, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. He lost numbers. He wasn't concerned. He knew the Father's the one who calls. And I love how he then approaches his disciples, specifically Peter. In verse 67, then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter emphasizes, we aren't leaving. Where else are we going to go for truth? They were being called. God was working with them. Jesus knew then who God was calling. He saw this, saw their fruits. Verse 69, also he had come to believe. Sorry, Peter still talking. Also we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. They weren't confused. They didn't think he was the living God. They knew he was the Son of the living God. God. Verse 70, Jesus said to them, Did I not choose you, the twelve, and one of you is a devil? Spoke of Judas Iscariot through this. But through this reminder, <clears throat> it's not by your might. It goes back to your calling, God opening up our minds and realizing what an honor to be given God's truth. Think of this important reminder that's given here. This reminder. It's not because we're so wonderful. Well, obviously God had to call me because I just, I knew I would get it. God showed us, opened up our minds. Think of that again. Wonderful privilege. The same reminder as he brought Israel out by his might. God the Father brings us out of spiritual Egypt by his might. Opening up our minds, calling us to his way to show us to live a different way, to come out of spiritual Egypt. So we see this first lesson to learn through these days. Not by your might. Not by your might. Second of these three lessons. <clears throat> not for your glory. Not for your glory. Turn back to Deuteronomy 4. We went through this quite a while ago as we were Still going through Deuteronomy and the Bible studies. It's been a fun study, and we're getting to the end. Maybe after the Days of Unleavened Bread, we may do a midweek Bible study where we can finish this section up. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Think of the intent that God had with Israel. They were to be living God's ways. They were to be practicing his laws. What a different nation. Can you imagine a nation that follows God's laws? Israel was to be an example. And we think of this example that's mentioned here, Deuteronomy 4, verse 1. 
Deuteronomy 4, verse 1, Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take anything from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. You don't add or take away. You don't add Easter and take away unleavened bread. You keep God's laws exactly how he gives them to us. The same example we have today. We think of this example as he goes through not going into idolatry. Verse 4, But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you the statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act accordingly, according to them in the land which you go to possess. Again, to live by God's laws, put them into practice. Why? So people will see how wonderful and smart you are. No, verse 6. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the people who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Think of if this could have been said because they kept following God's ways. Verse 7, For what great nation is there that has God so near to it? as the Lord our God is to us, for whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Keeps going on in this importance of God's ways. But again, Israel was to be an example. Here's a nation that has, look at how close God is to them. Wow, they're keeping his perfect laws, and look what a difference it makes. What an example. Again, it wasn't for Israel's glory. It was the point to look at their God. Look at their God's laws. Look at that, how perfect it is. It goes to that glory of God. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. <clears throat> Probably knew I was heading to this section. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Because it does remind us of this calling, and specifically as Paul starts to set the stage here, for we should be reflecting on it. Hopefully it's something we did before uh, the Passover, thinking of our calling, and how precious it is, and through these days of unleavened bread. Being humbled to remind ourselves it's not our glory, it's not our understanding. It's God in us. It's His ways we're trying to live. 1 Corinthians 1, <clears throat> verse 26. For you see, or you consider, your calling. Something we're to consider, to be thinking of, to reflect on. Wow. And that's why especially last night was a great reminder through it. It, doesn't just, it isn't just for the night to be much observed. But it's a time all year to, when you get down or things are going rough, you think, look at what God's done in my life. Where would I be without God? This reminder, for you see or consider your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Again, the emphasis comes back to God has chosen. Why? God has chosen. We see as it goes into verse 28, and the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Here's the reason that no flesh should glory. No, well, obviously God would have to choose me because I'm just smarter than everybody else. No, we see God's calling works with the foolish of the world. Think of this reminder in our lives. Why is God chosen you? Not because you're better, 
but because God is. God is the one who calls, and he's going to show it. it's through his might, not our own. So it goes back to that first point again, not by our might. And we see here is it's not for our glory that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Well, you think of Christ's perfect example. These things listed specifically here. He Again, Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God. Well, you go through every example of Christ and how he answered, how he explained things. Every example was perfect. It was perfect wisdom. How there's times where he was asked a question and there's times, well, I'll answer your question if you answer mine. He didn't go down the path that others thought he would go. He led perfect wisdom in every example that you see. He became for us wisdom from God and righteousness. He showed us perfectly how to live God's laws. And yet this world thinks, oh, well, he just did to do away with the law, so now you can do whatever you want. Garbage. He lived it to show us how to live it, how to put it into practice. Show us righteousness and sanctification, how our sins can be forgiven. And we see redemption made right with God. Jesus Christ, that perfect example in every area. And I love how it concludes this chapter here, verse 31, that as it is written, this quote comes from Jeremiah chapter 9, <clears throat> verses 23 and 24, as it is written, he who glories, nothing wrong with glorying. The problem becomes when you start glorying in yourself. You start name dropping, talking about yourself. He who glories, let him glory in the Lord. It's a reminder, it's not for our glory. One of my favorite speakers, the Feast of Tabernacles Sermonette, still think of the title of this day. It is not about you. It's not about us. It's about God calling us into this world, what he has done, what the Israelites should have pointed to. Wow, look at what he's done in our life. Look at how he brought us out of Egypt. It wasn't our might. It was God's. It's not our glory. It's God's glory. When we start name dropping and reflecting on ourselves instead of God's word, we get into big trouble. And during these days of unleavened bread, it minds us, it starts to puff us up. Or we have to be careful. Even, you know, I'll, I look at the how many are connected on YouTube at times. I'm like, oh, stop. It doesn't matter. If there's one person on YouTube, I'm trying to serve both congregations here. I don't care how many are there. We're pointing to God's word. We're coming together as two congregations the best we can. But when I made it public and there are more on there, I was like, oh, wow. It's like, stop. It's not about us. It's about God what God, who God has called. Again, it's not for our glory. It's for God's glory. So much in there. Leads us to the third and final of these lessons. <clears throat> these three knots. First one again, not by your might. Secondly, not for your glory. God should get all of the glory. All credit goes to God. Thirdly, not to do Nothing. This third lesson, not to do nothing. This world will end with Christ's sacrifice to some extent, even how they pervert that and his resurrection, which are pagan customs. They try to get somewhat right, but they don't because they're not keeping it by God's laws. God shows how to keep it. The arrogance to think that I know more than God and I'll take something else and worship God that way cannot be done. We think of this importance, this third step that the world leaves out. It ends with Christ's sacrifice and resurrection. What little they know of that and they think, well, now we can do whatever we want. It's the beginning steps of God's plan. These days of unleavened bread remind us that we have something to do. Leaven should have been put out last night at sunset, and that we are to be keeping it out. We're to be keep reflecting on the spiritual, to keep putting the flesh down in our life where those things come in and creep in at times. There's things we have to be doing. 
We think of that will of God. This third lesson, that is not to be doing nothing. We have things to be doing. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 24. This faith chapter, as we've gone through, I guess, a year or two ago, looked at all the action. It's amazing the action that has to be there with faith. We look at this action that was here with Moses. Hebrews 11, verse 24. <clears throat> By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He could have kept going that path, but why didn't he? Verse 25, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasure, the temporary pleasure of sin. He could have stayed Pharaoh's daughter, could have said, no, I'm not going to go down that path. God would have raised up someone else to lead them out, and he would have died in the Red Sea or at another time through the plagues. He could have enjoyed sin for a little bit, it would have been temporary. He knew the big picture. He knew what he was there, and even to go through the affliction to realize this is much more valuable, what God's way shows. We see in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, for he looked to the reward. He looked to what the future held. You see, as it goes into verse 27, By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Kept looking to God. We see, as it continues through into verse 28, By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, lest he who destroyed the firstborn should touch them. This faith, again, each one of these remind us of action, putting things into practice, doing them, living God's way. The Passover, just because they stayed inside, would have meant nothing. They had to put the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. They had to do something. They had to do what God commanded them. No one could have said, well, you know, I think I'll just put it around my flower pots. I think that's good enough. And oh, I think I'll put it over here, over the windows. They put the blood exactly where God gave the instruction, by God's word. Think of Moses again. Faith requires action. Moses choosing God's ways over the temporary pleasure of sin in Egypt. Even as it will lead us to the last day of unleavened bread of the Red Sea, verse 29, <clears throat> by faith, faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land, whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. Moses would have been among them, likely at that point, if he had said, I don't want this. I don't want God's ways. We think of, again, the action that's required. It's not about doing nothing. We put God's ways into practice. We live them. We keep the leaven out these days of unleavened bread with God's help. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> Romans chapter 12. Think of this action, what we are to be putting in our lives, that righteousness of God, and also what we're to be coming out of. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. <clears throat> Romans 12, verse 1. I beseech or I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy acceptable to god which is your reasonable service we think of those passover symbols we think of what christ went through as that sacrifice for our sins is it not reasonable that we are to be living sacrifices to continue on to be looking to christ's perfect example how did he handle this situation how should i be handling this how should i be putting that faith in God and trusting in Him, doing His will, 
We think of this reminder, we are to be presenting ourselves, our bodies, a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. These two verses, we've gone through a whole sermon just on these two verses in the past. So much in them. Good ones to dig into, reflect, look up each word, and how are we doing this in our life? Are we putting this into practice? Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. There are times, just as Israel was leaving Egypt, where the will of God didn't make sense when they looked at it. They were being led out a different way. This, this doesn't make sense. For those who understood the geography there, you're putting us in a trap. We can't get out. The Egyptians are probably laughing. Ha, this will be easy. We'll go take them back. And God's like, no, you're going to do what I show. Follow that cloud of uh, pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire is led them by day and by night to do God's will, to do what even when we think, well, that doesn't make sense. These days of unleavened bread. Why do I have to not eat leaven? Why can I just sneak a little bit here and there? Because God's laws show us how to live. What we are to be learning through these days. You think of not being conformed to this world. This world wants you to conform to it. Satan wants you to conform. Oh, just compromise a little bit here and there. Don't worry about it. You don't need to keep all 24 hours holy to God. It's not that important. Just keep the majority, or then maybe a little later, keep a little bit less, a little bit less. We think of this importance of living by every word of God, not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of your mind. See, other places will probably look at the last day of unleavened bread, putting that mind of Christ, living it, putting it into play, practice in our, in our life. This whole chapter is a wonderful one we've gone through. But dropping down to verse 9. <clears throat> Let love be without hypocrisy. We can put on the show. We can look like we are having love. We can act the part. But are we showing love? Are we caring? Are we looking out for others? It always amazes me when people will try to act the part and try to act like they're righteous. Do they not realize God can tell? God can tell if it's an act. Well, you can fool some humans, you can fool some people, but God sees the heart. Are they truly trying to help? Love, be concerned. Let love be without hypocrisy. As we think of these days of unleavened bread, what leaven represents this week's sin. Abhor what is evil. It's not just abhorring it. I love how then it says cling to what is good. Leaven should have been put out last night at sunset, and we're now to be keeping it out with our, God's help. But now, are we clinging to good? Oh, I've got more time now to study. You know, our houses are probably a little more clean. So, oh, how can I organize? How can I be digging into God's word more? We think of clinging to what is good, showing that love, caring, concern. We think of this importance again, this mentioned here, <clears throat> dropping down to verse 21. Especially at this time, seems like the past few weeks, so much of this evil can be overcoming, can overcome us in our life if we're not careful. Verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Through Christ's sacrifice, our sins can be forgiven with repentance. As we enter into these days of unleavened bread, as we did last night at sundown, Remembering, all right, it's not just enough to keep the leaven out. That's part of it. We've got to keep the leaven, that sin, out of our lives. But now we're to be overcoming evil with good, to be putting the good in. It's not enough just to remove the sin. Now, all right, now how do I need to be living? How do I got to put this into practice? Live by every word of God. Turn over to, well, you can put in your notes. We've read this earlier, John chapter 6 and verse 45. Again, mentions this action as Christ talks of. God the Father is the one who calls. And this principle that they are the ones who hear and have learned from the Father. 
We look at our Bibles. It's God's Word. Are we excited to read it? Uh, are we get too busy? Even uh, things creep in, even as we're preparing. and We get the physical leaven out, but are we also focused on getting that spiritual leaven out? Are we reflecting on God's Word more? Are we reading more? If we're watching more news and we're reading the Bible, you will become more fearful. You will, in time, quit looking to God. We got to keep looking to God's word. Keep looking to those examples of God's where we put our trust. That's where we look to every time. We think of that importance. There are things that we have to put into practice. So we think of follow God, live by every word of God. If you do nothing, you will fall away from God. If you do nothing, you will fall away from God. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. We'll, two more verses we'll look at here as we conclude. <clears throat> Think of Paul as he's leading up here, talking of the calling that we looked in 1 Corinthians 1. It goes through Christ crucified in chapter 2. I guess getting to the main point as he gets to chapter 5, in the deliberate sinning that was allowed. What kind of effect did not putting the sin out have on a congregation? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, <clears throat> begin in verse 1, 1 Corinthians 5, in verse 1, <clears throat> it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. And such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man has his father's wife, who's living in sexual relations with his stepmother. We think of verse 4, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. This puffing up is, again, that symbolism of the leaven, sin creeping in. Well, we can put up with this. At least he's still attending church, and he'll come around eventually. And no, you put the sin out. You're hoping the person repents and turns back, but you put the sin out. How quickly it puffed up the congregation. Verse 3 for I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirits, have already judged as though I were present concerning him who has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of, of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus point was you're hoping that the individual would repent you can see in second corinthians he does repent and come back that was the goal not to live in sin as this individual was doing and the congregation was allowing it verse six your glorying is not good where was the glory going was it going to god no, it's going to the congregation. Look at what we, we have bigger numbers. Well, yeah, there's a lot of people that are willfully sinning and not trying to overcome, but we have bigger numbers. Glorying. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? How quickly it prevails, how quickly it spreads. Little sin starts to spread fast, and, well, you know, they're doing it. It must be all right. No one's told them they can't be here. We think of how quickly sin spreads. Then we get to the therefore, verse 7. So what was to be done? Therefore, purge out the old leaven. This word purge out means literally clean out. Purging out that leaven, as we've done in the weeks leading up to last night, getting that leaven out. Here we see this analogy of that leaven, that sin. Cleaning out that sin in our lives as well. That can only be done through Christ's sacrifice in our repentance. We think of this reminder here, purging out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you, are tr you truly are unleavened. For indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. <clears throat> 
Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. It's another great phrase. We've gone through this in a sermon before, but look up sincerity and truth. Where else it is found? It's a great study for the days of unleavened bread. The thing, are we living that way? Are we living that unleavened bread of sincerity and truth? Are we keeping his festivals? Not just through unleavened bread, but all year round. Are we living that, that principle with sincerity and truth, looking to his word, sincerely striving in every way to live by every word of God. A lot in these two verse, these two words alone, but a good reminder, again, that we should be keeping the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth, putting the good in, living it, striving for every word of God. Turn over finally to First John chapter two. <clears throat> First John chapter two we read these I think last Sabbath also during unleavened or during the Passover service. First, uh, first John chapter two. <clears throat> think of again our goal, verse one, first John chapter two, verse one. My little children, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And I know I say it every time I read this verse because it reminds us that is our goal. Do not use the excuse, well, I'm human. That's just, I'm going to sin. It's going to happen. No, our goal is to be thinking on the spiritual, to be putting that old man, that old woman down and not letting it come up, keeping those sins out of our life, that that is our goal, that you may not sin this week. As we go through the days of unleavened bread, our goal is to keep the leaven out. It's also to keep the sin out. Our goal is not this week, well, unleavened bread, I think I'll probably just have probably one mistake where I'll probably eat some bread, and I'll probably have a couple sins this week. But other than that, that's my goal. Our goal is not to sin. Zero. That's what we're striving for, that you may not sin. And I'm thankful it doesn't stop there. Because things happen, it's like coming home on the first day of unleavened bread and grabbing the roll. It's like, ah, oh, no. Well, that's the end. No hope. No. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. I think we have that advocate comes back to Christ's sacrifice. We have to repent. We have to turn to God. Oh, I did this. Please forgive me and help me to get this out of my life. You think as it continues into verse 3, Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. keeps coming back to these three lessons. Not by our might. Our sins are forgiven through Christ's sacrifice. It's not for our glory. We didn't do anything to deserve it. And then we have something to do. It's not to do nothing. By this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Those who say that they can keep Easter instead of unleavened bread, through the word we see here, are not following God's ways. As it says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. We're to be keeping these days of unleavened bread with sincerity and truth, to be putting it into practice, living it. Again, not because we're perfect, but because of God's calling in our life to open our minds, ah, I've got to dig into this more. How do I become more like Christ? How do I put that mind of Christ in my mind? To be thinking as he did, he lived perfectly. No sin. We, looked at that, we look at that perfect example. Again, as Christ reminds us, following God's laws, learning from how Christ lived perfectly. <clears throat> 
How will we do this week? Apart from God, we will not do well. We always need God's help. With God's help, keep sin out. Think the physical leaven and the spiritual leaven. This This week reminds us of leavening all around us in the world. We may not be out as much as we normally are, but it still reminds us it's out there. How are we doing? Are we we conforming to the ways of this world? Are we conforming to the ways of God in our life? We are to be keeping sin out of our lives, living a different way of life, God's way of life. We're not to add to it. We're not to take away from it. We think of these three lessons. It's by God's might. It's for God's glory to continue to do the Father's will. We have things to keep doing, to put it into action. As we go through this week, let's stay close to God, prayer and Bible study. Always put God first and draw close to Him. When we sin, go to God and ask for that forgiveness, and it will be removed. Let's us keep the feast with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth.